It's good to be here with you. It seems like I, I know half of you, so I already feel at home. Um, uh, somehow, in uh, the scripture uh, passage that I, I must have sent, um, the uh, first part of the passage got cut off, and so it kind of a, uh, began rather abruptly. And the first part is actually fairly critical to what I want to reflect on with you. So let me go back and, and pick that up. Now, this is from the King James Version, only because Tristan came to my rescue and uh, found a Bible for me <laughs> online. <laughs> Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and uh, doubt not, Ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also ye shall do this unto the mountain. Be thou removed, and thou cast in the sea, and it shall be done. Uh, eh, okay. Yeah, here. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do you do these things? And who gives you this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, and if you tell me, I'll likewise tell you by what authority I do these things. And that's then when he picked up the, uh, the passage um, about the, uh, whether about John and then the passage about the vineyard. So thank you, Tristan. Your phone's different than mine, and I don't know how to turn it off, and I don't want to waste your battery. So, <clears throat> Jesus was asked, by what authority do you do these things and who gave you that authority? And it made me wonder, have you ever felt like you have no authority? <laughs> I have, quite frequently, I must admit. For example, when my firstborn was an infant, she had powerful lungs she could scream like a banshee, and when that happened at 2 o'clock in the morning, you can imagine Janet and I would be woken, shaken from the depths of sleep. If it was my turn, I'd drag myself out of bed and go to Colleen's room. I'd check her diaper. I'd check to see if she needed a bottle. You know the routine. You do whatever you can to settle down this little creature that wakes entire neighborhoods with her cries. And that's the extent of your authority. It pretty much stops right there. Your authority is to take care of this child. You can't talk her into not crying. You can't reason with the child that it's no longer necessary to cry because you're here to help. You can't bargain or bribe the child to cry only after 6 o'clock in the morning, please. As a parent, guardian, or caregiver, you have no authority other than caring for the child. Feeding, cleaning, soothing, holding, and bouncing. It took a while for me to understand this. Caring for infant Colleen's needs was the only authority I had in that context. Now, uh, now of course, it's vastly different. Now my daughters are young adults. Catherine turned 18 on Friday, and she and her sister went to see the Coldplay concert to celebrate. And if any of you have teenagers or young adult children, you know that as a parent, guardian, or caregiver, you have absolute authority. <clears throat> <laughs> Anything you say is readily received for its wisdom. And your years of experience are cherished <laughs> or not. We don't have to stretch our imagination too far to know what it's like to have no authority or to have your authority questioned or dismissed. A bureaucratic system, a tyrant boss at work, a person who already knows that they're right and they don't need to listen to you. If this connects in any way with your life, you know that you're in good company. Even Jesus was dismissed as having no authority. Jesus, whom other people claim to be a prophet, a great rabbi, a healer, the son of God, the prince of peace, was dismissed 
as having no authority or not a trustworthy authority. Consider the scene in today's reading. Notice where it all happens. Jesus enters the temple. That's how the story begins. Jesus enters the temple. Now, for the Jewish people, the temple was the axis mundi of the world, the center of the world. When you entered the temple, you were walking into the arena where heaven bends closest to earth. The temple was the umbilical cord to God. And do you see the irony? At the very spot where people are brought closest to God, the chief priests and the elders are not able to see the authority of Jesus because their attention is on other things, maintaining their position, their reputation, their own authority. They can't see the intrinsic authority of the Nazarene who stands before them. They ask the kind of questions that, that we ask. By what authority are you doing these things? And who said you could do them? In other words, do you have a PhD? From where? With whom did you study? Have you published? Who is your publisher? And what's your pedigree? Did you grow up in Wally or West Point Gray? <laughs> do you blog? How many followers do you have? How many friends on Facebook? We size people up all the time to get a sense of their authority. Can we trust them? That's all we want to know. Is this someone I should be listening to? And though it's ironic that the chief priests and the elders, the heads of the religious institutions, needed to ask Jesus' authority, I don't blame them, really. We do it all the time to get a read of the person to see whether or not they're trustworthy. Is this somebody I should listen to? Can I trust this boss? Will she treat me with respect? Can I trust this guy and invite him up into my apartment? Can I trust the surgeon who will soon be cutting me open? Basically, the chief priests and the elders, the ones entrusted with protecting the institution of religion and the temple, were asking Jesus, can we trust you? And the honest answer to their question would have been no. You can't trust someone like Jesus to uphold temple politics. You can't trust someone like Jesus to tow the party line and overlook injustices or questionable ethics. You can't trust someone like Jesus to just play along and with the prescribed sound bite. In this sense, he came not to bring peace to temple politics, but a sword. He was a disturber of the peace and a disruptor of the status quo because he was spirit-filled and God-led. And there was no way he could color within the lines and stay within the contrived boundaries. No way. And Jesus knew that if the religious leaders had to ask for his authority, well, then they wouldn't understand. And so he didn't bother to tell them. They may not have been able to see him, but he saw through them pretty well. Asking Jesus for his certificate of authority might be similar to asking Joe Roberts, you know, the guy who was pushing the cart across Canada 9,000 kilometers to raise awareness for homeless youth and addiction and encourage people to get off the streets and into recovery. It would be like asking him, what's your authority? It would be like hearing the story of, from a mother who witnessed horrible violence in Syria and came to Canada to a place of safety, but uh, still carried the terror within her. Or hearing how the opioid crisis affects the frontline paramedic or hearing how the person of African heritage experiences racism even today, even in Canada. Or hearing how an indigenous person spent their years in residential school. And then having the audacity to ask, yeah, but who, who gave you the authority to speak? Are you serious? They speak from the authority of the integrity of their own experience. 
someone who speaks about their addiction and recovery, about the horrors of war, about racism, about being a healer in a drug-infested city, speak with an intrinsic authority that rises from their own suffering, their own experience, their own hard-won truth. Well, Jesus spoke from his own authority, a hard-won authority honed in the wilderness, an authority that came from his connection with the Spirit, as if the power cord was plugged directly into the source. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, behind the Greek with authority is the rabbinic term gevura. And gevura means from the mouth of power, from the mouth of spirit. When people heard Jesus speak and they watched him heal, they'd exclaim, what is this? A new teaching with authority? And that authority came from the mouth of power itself. And so, who in the story recognizes that authority? That's the interesting question. To the world of politicians and religious leaders, Jesus had no trustworthy authority. To people who had something to lose, wealth, status, position, the unpredictable, untamable Jesus was most often seen as a threat. He's the kind of person who could stroll into the temple courtyard and release mayhem by turning over the tables for injustice, uh, for the unjust, unjust economy that that represented. He could do that, and he did. How could a responsible person with power to protect the uh, traditions trust him? They couldn't. But to those who had no position, no power, no status, no wealth, to those who were on the margins, the unclean, the neglected and pushed aside and depressed, to anyone who thirsted for God, longed for love, raged for justice, panted for peace, ah, to them his authority was immediately recognizable. They did not need to ask. They knew because something in them recognized his searing authority. They knew because something in them was lifted up and healed. And they knew that they did not need to ask him for a certificate, a diploma, because his authority came from another source that brought them to ask, who is this guy? He doesn't speak like the scribes and the Pharisees. What about you? What about us? We who are part of the progressive church, who appreciate a broad theological range, who encourage questions and welcome doubt as a respected guest, from where does our authority come? You know, sometimes confession, sometimes I envy the Bible thumpers, the one who wave the good book in the air and shout their faith because it's all so neat and prescribed, the answers all sewn up in their minds, or the fan at the football game who holds up the sign reading John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Boom, there it is, all tied up with a bow and handed to you for your salvation. Wouldn't that be a relief? You could just point to the Bible and say, there it is. There's the authority. You can read it right there. But for some Christians, authority comes from being saved or born again or anointed by the Spirit. But what about us? We who choose not to thump the Bible over somebody's head, who may not pull out a born again card, what is our authority? For those of us in the 21st century, shaped by a culture of science and critical thinking, what about us? From where does our authority come? If this feels like an uncomfortable question, maybe that's because you're smart enough to connect the dots. If well-respected, educated, articulate leaders didn't recognize Jesus' authority, what chance on earth do I have for those same folks recognizing my authority. Maybe 
None at all. But you know what? That's not our concern. We don't need to pull out our credentials. We don't need to prove our authority to anybody, which is a pretty good thing, because our, our authority, I believe, rests on something pretty humble. Our authority, in fact, rests not on what we've accomplished or earned. Our authority rests on what we lack. Not on something that we possess, but on something that is absent. Our authority rests on our yearning, our longing for a love that never dies, a deep and abiding peace, a world marked by justice. And if we keep awake to that yearning, then we make room for God. If we claim to possess God, we lose God. And Jesus knew that he had no authority whatsoever apart from God. He didn't need to claim any authority for himself or prove himself to his examiners in the temple. If he had, he would have lost the authority that he claimed to have. Our authority rests on our willingness to be awake to the ache, the tug of the heart, alive to the longing of the soul that opens us to God and the world as it is. That's our spiritual practice. To watch and notice the life-giving yearning. And you see, when we notice the ache and hold the yearning and attend to the longing and don't rush in to fill it with distractions, we make room for the work of grace. The Spirit comes out and plays through us. Our body and soul become a playground for God. And when that happens, fear resides Anxiety loses its grip and we discover gifts and tap into a current of joy we never knew were there. I think of the laughter of Louis Armstrong. Now, Louis was no saint. He was a flawed human being, as surely as I am, and I don't know, perhaps you too. But Louis brought a gorgeous beauty into the world. He would close his eyes and play, or throw his head back and sing in that gravelly voice, and then at the end of the piece, invariably, he would break into a broad smile and laugh. He wasn't celebrating how great he was. In that smile and laugh, he was celebrating the music that flowed through him. It was the music that made him laugh. And no one to this day questions the authority music had over Louis Armstrong. Our spiritual practice is not to sing how great we are, but how great is that life force, this music, this big joy that moves and plays through us. That's where our authority resides, not in the car we drive, not in the size of our bank account, the number of degrees or awards. Our authority resides in our longing for home in God and our ache for a world marked by justice. Our authority resides in the things that we do and say that flow from that longing and that ache. That authority, often unrecognized by the world, leads to the path of life. And that authority is already yours. May we live into the fullness of this. Amen.